Um, good afternoon, folks. Jack Allstock here. The title of this webinar is Are File Servers Dead? The straight answer to that is, in most cases, probably. In all cases, no. Um, we just need to talk about it. Let's talk about what file servers traditionally are. A file server is basically a repository to store files for users. And what sort of files would they store? Could be Excel spreadsheets, it could be access databases. Today we're obviously talking about companies storing uh, a lot of different styles of files. It could be uh, marketing material for a um, fresh food company. Hey, we see a lot of that coming up today. Uh, U Foods uh, is one of them. Uh, it could be files for a football club. It could be files for a manufacturing company. A builder, for example, could be files for a, uh, a mining site. So we're now getting these, these different sites of uh, types of data that people are asking us to store. Now, I was dealing with a company yesterday in Brisbane. They were looking for a target for some backups, um, type of backups. We're based on a um, Postgres style backup. Excuse me for a minute, please, folks. I just needed a cough. I didn't want everybody's eardrums to get hurt. Um, he was looking for a backup target for a host-based backup product, and, and again, you know, it's a file that needs to be stored. So files aren't just about your old spreadsheets, your old, you know, Word documents these days. Files can be mean, mean anything. You know, some some data has more importance than other data. So it's about protection of that data as well, um, and it's also about who can access what, where, when, and how. I was talking to a gentleman this week who uses a traditional file server and the reason he does it is because of the um, 34 different sites that all come back via remote terminal sessions to a single uh, file server that has, as you can imagine, these 30 odd sites or whatever it was, um, 800 users. They've all got different permissions and structures and it's a very convoluted permission structure that he has to put in place because of all the different people and he prefers to have a MT type server, a Windows 2012, 16, 19, whatever it might be. Um, he prefers that. He knows he's, he's got limitations with that if crypto locker comes in and whatever else. So, there are courses for courses. Now I'm just going to show you a different method of doing the same thing today. Uh, in a lot of cases, um, you know, if somebody's presenting to me with um, 15 to 20 terabytes of data, of data <coughs> um, what type of data that is uh, is potentially un un not relevant to the discussion. Well, we're just going to talk about what it is. So, are file servers dead? The answer typically is no, but in a lot of cases the answer could be there is a better way of doing it. And the better way of doing it is what we call a one site. This is still the old Exablock screen. Um, within the next six months it will convert over to onesystem.storagecraft.com. It is live now for the release of a, uh, of a one site solo. Um, but they will shift everything over to that. So this here is a particular uh, one system or one safe that I have. Uh, I've called it Roman. Um, I've picked on every town I can in Queensland, a few in New South Wales. I'll probably start on Perth next or Western Australia. Just because I can, I blow it away on a regular basis just for testing purposes. So if I click on this one, you will immediately see some information. I'll just turn my phone off, folks. This is making a collar noise over there. Um, so over on the right hand side here, 
you can see that today um, I've, I've thrown some 7.4 uh, gig at it and it's only written 274 meg to this particular device. I've only got one node in my ring or cluster if you prefer and I'm getting a pressure ratio of 27 to 1. You know, it goes up and down and fluctuates. My lifetime one, which is a fairer as example, is 13 to 1. The majority of data I'm storing on here is backups. Okay? And is that impressive? Probably, but it's uh, a mixture of host-based and agent-based backups from one of our products. It also does have some uh, files stored on there, and I'll show you the shares of that later on. But more important, I think, is this is where we should come to. Um, our file server's dead. Well, this is a particular, this is an older version um, of our software, uh, sorry, of, of the piece of hardware. This is the super micro version. The newer version is a Dell server. Uh, the Dell server is, is obviously different, but it's different in characteristics. Um, the Dell one has 10 gig ports all across the bottom, whereas this one's got two 10 gig ports here. The drag, high drag, whatever you want to call it, is there. Uh, the Dell one has by default two um, SFB pluses on it at the top, and I've got over here two 1 gig ports. Um, that I use for collection at the moment, but also management. Um, two, two power supplies, and you'll see two SSDs here. Well, on the, on the 4412, they don't exist. So what they did was these two drives here are not mirrored. They are just uh, combined it together. Uh, that's got the, SSD, uh, the index on it. On the 4412, they spread the index across all the drives. So some fundamental differences, uh, performance improvements with the 4412 over the 4312, which is what this is. But most people look at this thing and go, all right, so what is this thing? Why is it, you know, why do we say file servers are dead? The first thing I'd like to talk about is this is not an array. Please do not get it confused. And so we'll pick it across the middle row here. There's a three terabyte hard drive. This one's a six terabyte hard drive. This one is an eight terabyte hard drive, and this one's a four terabyte hard drive. And people are already thinking in their minds, Jack, are you silly? Yeah, maybe old age is caught up with me. No. The object here, folks, Sorry about that, folks. I really am having some connection problems here. Um, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind, is that sounding better for you? 
Andrew, you're still connected? Anybody? Okay, I'll assume that I'm back. I was having some... Okay, thanks guys. I simply apologise for that, folks. I'm um, sort of stuck in a strange place at the moment, so I've connected to something else to try and get it through. I am seeing that my connection isn't as good as it should be, so I apologise for that. Let's move on. Let's go back to here. Um, the important part of this whole discussion, folks, um, is here. All right. This is this whole box is not an array. All those disks are actually a JBOD. Um, the JBOD in this case is individual disks. So that's why I have crazy numbers of disks in here. Eight terabytes, four terabytes, six terabyte, three terabyte. It doesn't matter because it just treats them as single disks. There is a huge advantage to this, obviously. Um, it obviously makes a lot of sense to have the same size disks in there. Um, I don't because I like to show people that you can do something silly like this. It doesn't make a lot of sense to do this, but it explains um, the way it works. All right, because when you uh, initialize one of these things, you get an opportunity to say, <coughs> pardon me, I'm going to use three copies or I'm going to use two copies. And so three copies means that, and I'll, I'll use this number up here as an example, we're going to call that 60 terabytes, right? <coughs> if I say, right, I'm going to create three copies, so that means I'm only going to have 20 terabytes available for use. And you go, okay, that's a bit of a limitation. Well, is it really? Because if I take the 20 terabytes, and I come back up here, and I go for the um, I go for my lifetime. Um, all right, and let's make it ten to one. If I take my twenty terabytes, I've used or well, multiply it by ten. I've got two hundred terabytes, and how much storage do I actually have on this thing? Sixty terabytes. So you start to see that there's obviously some, something going on underneath this thing that's that's making something you know stand out, um, and that that's something that that's there is what we need to talk about. Okay, first thing before we move on to that something that makes this thing quite a nice bit of kit to talk about, obviously, is if one of those disks does fail. All right. You just simply replace it. So if this three terabyte disk over here, yeah, well that's a four terabyte, that's an eight, six, there's a three terabyte. If that Western Digital three terabyte fails and I go and get myself a, um, uh, on this model, the biggest one I can go is an eight terabyte. It's the old super micro one. So I go down and I buy for myself an eight terabyte Seagate Iron Wolf disk, all right? SATA hard drive, and I push, I, I take that drive out because it failed and I whack a new one in there, what happens? Well, I don't have to go through a whole lengthy process of an array rebuild. I go through a very short rebalanced process because when the new disk hits there, the system automatically goes, oh, okay, so that three terabytes gone, I've now got a brand new eight terabyte drive, I am going to rebalance. And what rebalance means is it takes over and says, I'm now going to take my fair share of the three copies that I need to have in relationship and in, re in ratios compared to the other disks. So if every disk was half full, the eight terabyte disk that I threw in there would now be 50% full whereas the three terabyte disks would only be one and a half terabyte full. And that's the way the process works. But how long would that take? Probably about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, maybe an hour, depending upon how full it was. And so that's one of the benefits. Now, 
how does this thing work, why does it work, and where do we get the horsepower from, what is the benefit of all of this stuff. So to, to describe that, potentially what I'm going to do is just over here. Now, if anybody's ever tried to explain to you what object-orientated storage was, I bet you're like me and you're sitting there scratching your head, how the hell do I describe what object-orientated storage is? Now, and keep it simple. You know, there's, there's people listening in on this webinar right here and right now that go, what the hell is he talking about? What's an object? Okay. In desperation one day, I'm sitting there racking my brains like this in a webinar, but it was actually a go-to meeting for a customer. And I'm sitting there trying to explain how object-orientated storage works. And it might sound silly, but I thought, you know what? Why not? Let's do it this way. And I said to this particular customer, I said, would you please hold your right fist in front of your face? And he did. And I said, you see that fist? He goes, yep. I said, that's an object. And he goes, right, I get that. I said, now hold your left fist in front of your face. That's another object. And he goes, right, I got that. So what is that object? That object is a, a variable length chunk of data that it recognises and says, well, before it gets written to disk, there is a special uh, high-speed SSD disk that is sold to one of the memory chips that in line it looks at the data coming in and does a real fancy algorithm over it and says, here's a chunk I recognise, and it recognises again and again and again. So I'm going to use that as my algorithm, and that's my chunk. That is my data. That is my object. So it writes that object to disk. All right. Obviously, when it writes that object to disk, it then has to have the metadata that says, this is a chunk of data from that file. And it might be, you know, chunk 63 or 22 out of that file. All right. So that, that object gets written to disk. Now, in three copies, it will be written in random to any three of those 12 disks. That object, when it gets written to those disks, is what they call a mutable. Cannot be written to. Okay? You can't, you can't write to it ever again. You can't modify it. That object is immutable. All right? So the next time we see that object appear in a file, all right, we see that object, we go, oh, I already know what that object is. So it says... I don't need another copy of that object. It throws that chunk of data away and says, right, here's the metadata that points to the original object, and is now the metadata that says object number one is now um, object 22 out of file whatever, and then it says, right, so I'm using the same object for potentially hundreds of files, and I just write the metadata to disk. Okay? Remember, the object is immutable. Now, these boxes, and I'm going to say this in general terms, these boxes, these, this object-oriented storage is crypto-locker safe. It is not crypto-locker proof. Because every 30 seconds when you throw data at one of these devices, we snapshot the metadata because the objects are already immutable. We snapshot the metadata, and the metadata then becomes, that snapshot of that metadata becomes immutable. And so, Mr. CryptoLocker, do what the hell you want. Knock your software, encrypt what you want, I don't care. Okay? But in reality, I do care. And in the re release that's coming out very soon, I've seen parts of this release, but it's version um, 3.2 something or other. When Mr. CryptoLocker comes along, it used to be a bit of a, a pain in the neck. You used to have to delete the top layer, go down to one of the snapshots, right-click copy and right-click paste. Well, they've simplified that process and just said, this is the layer I want, and just promote that back to the top layer to make life a lot easier for us. So Mr. CryptoLocker cannot get hold of the snapshots Mr. CryptoLocker cannot get hold of the objects. He might create a whole bunch more snapshots, and we're just going to go ignore them 
I'm just going to use this. And so that's why I say it's CryptoLocker safe. It is not proof. If you ignore Mr. CryptoLocker and you let it go on for, you know, forever and ever and ever, I mean, well, you deserve what you get, I guess, in the end. But, you know, it is CryptoLocker safe. It can help you dramatically. So the whole concept of object and metadata snapshots is great. Probably one of the other really nice things with this too is that those snapshots that we that we have, a Windows client will see them as previous versions. So when they go into the to the folder that's that they've got stored, you know they've mapped a drive to one of these machines the snapshots appear as previous versions. So they can go back and find the file they want for themselves, by themselves. They can try and modify it like crazy. It will not work. They'll have to take a copy of it, put it on their computer or wherever, or put it back up in the top level and whatever they want to do with it. And then they can go to their heart's content. They cannot modify anything that's that's been snapshot. They cannot modify the objects. They cannot modify the snapshot of metadata. So it helps them out, okay? Uh, so that, that's the basic concept of what a one safe is. Um, is, is it, uh, does it make a file server obsolete? No, it doesn't, but it goes pretty close for a lot of people. A lot of people are using these things for, you know, geo scans of mine sites, um, football games. There's a football club in Victoria that use one of these things. Um, they get the four main cameras of, at a football match and they get all those, that, that video, and they pump it on one of these things. And then through the week, the um, 12 or 13, whatever coaches they have for this club, bring in their individual players and they've got these Apple Macs with this special software on it. And these 12 coaches or whatever they are, sit with the individual players and they live stream off one of these machines and say to the player, you know, the fine nuances of that of that particular game which you lost on me, uh, they they show them, you know, you should have, you know, done this this way, and you should have done that that way, or you know, you should have dug him in the ribs this way. I don't, I don't know what they talk about. They talk about something, obviously, um, but yeah, that's what they use it for. So it's uh, my sites are using it. Building companies are using it because the 3D AutoCAD files, the huge files of these days, but they're getting compression detube out of them that makes them smaller and they're, 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 they're safe from crypto locker. They've been, one company in, Melbourne, um, in Brisbane's been hit twice because um, it was interesting. I was at a um, presentation this morning for an MSP up in, in uh, Mackay and when I said 80% of clickers is where you get your infestation of um, ransomware, crypto locking type stuff. Everybody in the room laughed and they said, actually, you know, you're probably right. 80% of people are clickers. Well, yeah. But this thing helps, as all I'm trying to say. Um, so we'll move on a little bit. Let's have a look at some shares and exports, right? Now, I'm using um, a lot of NFS shares with um, the Shadow State product that I've got. But it's, it's okay, we can use, we can see what's going on. So here, this is a, a, an NFS share, as you can see. And um, compression, I've got 7.5 gig, and lifetime is 2.4 terabytes. Okay? Uh, you can see exactly what's going on there. We'll go back to the list. And you can pick any one of these. This is the ESX host itself. We'll have a quick look at that one. These are backups again. Um, 1.5 gig, all right, I've only got one, I'm backing up at that level, uh, 586 gig lifetime, um, you never saw this one folks, you're supposed to back up a hyper host apparently, 1.6 gig and I've written 864 gig uh, lifetime on that one. Um, the interesting one, of course, is uh, this one down here, the SMB share, which has just got traditional files in it. And lifetime there, it's just simply saying to me that I've got 1.07, those standard sort of looking files. Um, not getting an awful lot out of that. 
on that. So the compression there is just 63.2 gig. And that doesn't really tell me a lot until I go down here and I look at the reports and I have a look at the share utilisation and that's the SMB share. So it's 937 gig and there's the agent one at 382 and you can see some bits and pieces going on. And this is the stuff that I, I find more useful today. Um, not that, go away. I think I just went and screwed it all over here, so I did. But that's okay. Um, in here, obviously, you can see uh, daily dedupe there. It says it's just one. Um, it's just showing me today's figures. You can see the performance logs of it. You can see what the CPU's been doing and all those sorts of things. Um, and settings, obviously. This thing is joined to the domain. Um, therefore, on the shares here in particular, uh, if you come down to this one here again, um, you'll see down here that I've got access-based enumeration turned on, which is something I find rather interesting. A lot of people don't... Um, <coughs> sorry. I find it interesting. A lot of people don't quite understand what access-based enumeration is. It is a very effective tool to stop people that don't have the execute right to get into a folder. All right, they don't use it. So if you don't have the execute right to say the admin folder, well, you don't even see the admin folder. Only the admin people do. So it's something that's been around since 2003, and a lot of people don't tend to investigate the rights of what that thing can do. Yeah. Um, so you can see the basic settings here, folks. Um, pardon me. Uh, now, of course, there's one other final thing that I'd like to talk about. Um, backing this thing up. Do I need to back it up? In a true sense of the word, probably not. How about we think of something else? Why don't I replicate it to another location? So I can have the inbuilt replication in this thing that's not replicating. And this is the hard part, I think, for people. Um, the hard part for people is understanding I'm not replicating files. I'm replicating snapshots and objects. And so therefore I'm replicating the smallest amount of bits of information that I need to. And it's interesting that the source machine is not pushing anything. It is the destination machine that's pulling it. And so what they say, uh, the terminology they use is the destination machine says, right, give me the first wave. And the first wave is the objects and the metadata associated with the first snapshot. Okay? And it checks to see that nothing's changed and says, right, I've got that. Now give me the second wave and then the third and the fourth and the fifth. So it's only pulling down the objects that it physically needs to, um, to complete the, the, the file structure, if you want. <coughs> um, so it, the replication is, is quite efficient, very efficient. There's a couple of little things that you need to do, obviously. Um, you'll notice here, for example, my MTU size has been changed because if you go across a layer to network, the way this thing is built, its default is 1500 and they have a flag set on the TCP IP packet that says uh, do not fragment. And so when you hit the layer 2 switching, which is your ISP router, packets don't go anywhere. And it's just one of those things if you say automatically set it to 1472 and yeah it works an interesting side note folks interesting the things you'll learn over time i got one of these in a day a builder a building company that build houses and a lot of their a lot of their workers actually use terminal servers sitting up in a, in azure 
actual auto cab blokes are sitting on the ground next door to one of these things, so it's fast for them, great for them, whatever, but when the people in the cloud need to be able to get hold of something and have a look at some stuff, you know, they got read only um, right to some drawings and they've got a lightweight version of AutoCAD that just loads up pictures for them, right? And we found that they couldn't even see the one safe. And so we did a bit, bit of digging around and we found out that the Azure Cloud via the, I can't remember the actual name of it, I'm sure you guys will know what I'm talking about, some special gate gateway to get back down to the ground, some sort of VPNing structure that they've got on Azure services. The size of the MTU allowed between the Azure cloud and the ground was an MTU size of 1360. So we had to modify the MTU of these boxes to 1360 and everything started to work. And I thought that was pretty strange, but anyway. And one of the other things we've learned over the time too is that typical NAS boxes um, I'm just bringing this open for a second just so you can see. Um, and I'll just click on this, right? And you can see here that if I open up, I don't know if I open up anything here. There's a bit of data here I've got here. You'll notice here that I don't seem to have a tab turned on called free spot. If I go right click over here, and you can find it here somewhere, free space, maybe I'm in the wrong place. Maybe it's turned it off completely, but there's a free space tab that you can get in Windows Explorer. Is it in you? Maybe, if I go to deep end. There's a tab you can show that says free space. Free space, if you show that against the one safe, slows down the browsing to the nth degree. It just stops browsing completely. And as soon as you turn it off, so that it says, this is all I want, um, it works like that. It just, it's browsing, it's quick, smooth, efficient, and everything else. So there's been some interesting stuff we've learned about. So from my perspective, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. It, it, it works. Um, so our file server's dead. Most cases, probably yes. In certain cases, no. But for a lot of the big data files that are kicking around today, there are better alternatives, folks. You know, and when you sort of take into account the cost of one of these things, the complexity of one of these things, you don't need a science degree. If I can use one, and I'm no genius, if I can use one of these things, anybody can. And I think that's the beauty of one of these things particularly down in here. I had one bloke ring me up one day and said, so I need a hard drive. I said, yep. He said, well, how do I order one? I said, you go to wherever you buy your hard drive from. You couldn't believe that he could just go down and buy um, a standard hard drive, side of hard drive. I actually loaned one of these to a guy one day for a trial proof concept, and he half filled it with, uh, with some digital greens. Well, I didn't sort of think that was a smart move, but heck, for what he wanted to do, it worked. I wouldn't do that in production, I can tell you, but anyway. All right, folks, so let me now see. Uh, Shiva has asked if I have no slides. I don't use slides, sir, I'm sorry. If you want this video to remind you, um, it will be posted up on to uh, YouTube as soon as I can get it to the marketing girl. Uh, Mia, she will post it up for you. So anybody else got any specific questions they would like answered? Did I not cover off something? Uh, any other information you would like? I just think, folks, if you think about what you're trying to achieve with this thing, how about I talk about this and, you know, these are, I'm trying to be honest here. What is this thing good for? It's good for certain types of backups. Do not point SPX at this thing. You will be totally disappointed. Totally. Point Shadow Safe at it. Point Veeam at it. If you do Veeam weekly backups, you know, 
you do veen monthly backups, you will get four to one compression minimum of this box. No problem at all. I have a customer now who's, who's actually getting about seven, seven and a half to one compression DJ out of three of these things. He's got one in Papua New Guinea, one in Fiji and one in Brisbane and he's not backing those beam backups up anymore. He's just replicating Brisbane to PG, PNG. PNG's backing up the Fiji. Fiji's backing up the Brisbane. That's it. The Fiji, you know, I won't pick up Fiji, we'll pick up Brisbane. If Brisbane slides, if, if the Brisbane offer slides into the Brisbane River, which hopefully that won't happen, but he's got backup sitting somewhere else. So he can rebuild the infrastructure for this company anywhere he likes using the Beam software. So that's what he's been able to achieve. It's taken so much complexity out of their business. Um, there were a few teething problems we had with, because um, he was trying to do like three monthly backups, sorry, a backup that lasts three months and there was complications with Beam corrupting a few things. So he uh, said, well, why don't I just do monthly backups and keep them for three months? And it'll work that way. So he said, fine, I'll just I'll adjust what the program wants to do. Um, this thing didn't have a problem. But, so it's good for, you know, Beam and Storage Drive shadow, uh, shadow Save backups. It's great for file systems. Um, if you're going to save huge amounts of JPEGs on here, you're not going to get a lot of compression DG out of it. But if you look at the speed, as one of, them, one of the marketing companies are, you're going to get the speed out. The Apple people are going to think this is better than sliced bread. Um, so it depends what you're trying to do. But by all means, reach out to us, talk to us, and we will help you out with um, you know, the, right, the right idea of what this thing's good for. Okay? So any final questions, folks? Did I miss anything? Hmm. Either that or you can't hear me. Right. Sid has got one. I'm planning to refresh my file server. Sid, um, again, I would ask some questions and by all means, you know, uh, contact me directly, contact your uh, storage graph person. It's a, I'm planning on refreshing my file server to me. It's an open-ended question. Um, if it's a simple four terabyte file server with only you know like a terabyte a year, um, then I'm going to say you know you're probably still cheaper to go with the file server. Um, one of these things at, at your buy price, you know, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. So I priced up you know a small a server against one of these things um, with the same amount of disk space in it. This thing comes out way cheaper than a server by a long shot. Um, so it's, it depends on what you're trying to achieve and I definitely would rather have that conversation with you because I'm not going to try to push something on you that you know, I don't see the, the, the benefit in our relationships with you as MSPs and customers of, of selling you something that becomes a boat anger. I don't see the point. But if you want to have the open conversation with us about it, there is a case where for you know, a file server and a backup storage for a you know mid-sized business, I can sell you one of these things and we can do both jobs at the same time because, <coughs> pardon me, because of the object orientation storage, even though it's treated like a NAS box, those two shares will never see each other because underneath the objects are separated, they're objects, and therefore a user, if you pull one of those hard drives out of this thing and try to investigate it, you're going to find some rubbish on there that you have no idea what it is. It's written down, the file system we actually use is SMASH FS. Have a look, at, have a look up what it actually is. It's, it's a completely different um, file system. It has some semblance to ZFS, 
uh, has some semblance to um, the um, cloud source one. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Anyway, it it is a completely proprietary soft file system that just nobody can even work it out. If you want to put encryption at rest, you can do that as well. But it, um, I need to know more about whether I'm doing a server refresh. Uh, I need more info. Um, one of the other gentlemen here is a, a smaller, a slightly different question, which is good. Uh, the question is, is there a smaller version of this thing? Um, the plan is sometime this year, and I'm not 100% sure when it will come through. Uh, they're, they're planning on bringing out an S3, SX3000 which is a maximum of six drives. Uh, I have no idea on the pricing, I have no idea when it's going to hit the deck. Um, none of that information. I think the, I'm not 100% sure where, where the process is going uh, at all. So I think there's even plans uh, to take this as a container and stick it on top of a uh, uh, of an ass box and utilise it that way as well uh, in the next couple of years, which to me makes a lot more sense. I don't create a couple of lungs, uh, six lungs, twelve lungs on a NAS box and, and then stick the container on top and smash it best and all, all the functionality and do it that way as well. I know that I think about that as well. So. Uh, now you're trying to tie me up in circles, Lee. Um, a uh, bit of an offline call here. Um, Lynn, I will talk to uh, talk to you later to, at a later time, mate, that's all right. The answer you're looking for is potentially yes. Folks, I'll be honest with everybody that's on the conversation still. Uh, if you have a case, um, I have access at this point to two units. <coughs> One's a 4312 like this one. The other one is a 4412 which is the Dell box. Um, performance wise, the Dell might be you know, slightly quicker. Uh, it functions identically. I can actually have a ring that's got a 4312 and a 4412 in the same ring. Um, so if you have a case study, uh, proof of concept that you want to try one of these things, we have a 4312 sitting in Sydney as well. Um, if you put your case forward, as Lynn's just done, I'm not going to say where he's from, um, I will get it processed and we can get a demonstration unit out to you. It might be full of three terabyte or four terabyte hard drives. Um, that's okay. Um, you can have a play with it, have a look at it, reseed it, uh, blow it away. Back to reset it, try it a different way, do different things, set it up in three node copies, uh, three copy node or two copy node, whatever else. So if you can send me, get Wayne to send me an email and I'll get that in play straight away. And the same deal goes for everybody else. Um, if there's, there are New Zealand partners here as well on this call, I've seen a few of you. Um, that might be a little more difficult, but there's no, there's nothing to stop us from trying, folks. Okay, so if you've got a business case, that stands up for us to have a crack at getting you, even a forty-three twelve, just have a play. Um, we're more than happy to try and do that for you. Okay, as I said, I've got two in Queensland right now. One's out at the customer's office, another one sitting in my office. Um, the power supplies, I've rattled the power supplies out of the current one. I've got two brand new ones from the States, so I should be able to get the 4312 back up and running. There's a 4312 like this one down in Sydney as well, 
the use down there as well. So if you have, a, have an opportunity that you would like to try this out, if you do work for mining companies or you do work for builders, great place to store some of their stuff is on one of these things. I've got a mining company now that's got 22 of these things for sticking their geo, geophysical data, I don't know what they call it, their laser you know, scans of property, whatever. So, yeah. Okay. Melinda, you can just send me an email. All right, folks, at that point, I hope you've got something out of this. It's more to generate thought processes around where we should be going. I'm not trying to flog you one of these things. I'm just trying to actually say to you, think about what we're trying to achieve. Because CryptoLocker, the new version that's out there today in ransomware, does not put an extension on the file. It puts two bits in the header, or five bits inside the header of a file. The file does not look any different, but it is locked. You cannot open it. And nobody knows the difference until the day they're going to try and use a file. You need to have extra things in place to actually protect yourself today. Okay, so I hope you got something out of that. And at that point, folks, I am going to say have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye.